We have reviewed so far how the United Nations put in place an international system of protection for human rights and freedom of expression in particular. In this segment, we're going to start looking at how those systems of protection for human rights and freedom of expression in particular have been established at regional level, beginning with Europe. And to do so, we are going to go back in time. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which we were reviewing in the previous segment, was adopted in 1968. In fact, 20 years earlier, Europe had already moved towards adopting a convention on the protection of human rights, binding on its member states and including a provision on freedom of expression. Immediately after World War II, European governments had taken resolute steps towards what was described as European integration, seen as an essential step toward ensuring that the horrors of World War II were never repeated. In 1949, the government of 10 European countries established the Council of Europe through the Treaty of London, whose Article 1 states, the aim of the Council is to achieve a greater unity between its members for the purpose of safeguarding and realizing the ideals and principles which are their common heritage. It's Article 3, identify these ideals as follow. Every member of the Council of Europe must accept the principles of the rule of law and the enjoyment by all persons within its jurisdiction of human rights and fundamental freedom. Rule of law, human rights, fundamental freedom. These were neither aspirational nor theoretical. They were real and I think they have become increasingly so. The commitment to European unity responded at the time to three forces. First, it was a response of European leaders to the many conflict that had plagued the continent for centuries, but in particular, the last two conflict and the carnage that had happened. In 1949, governments and citizens of Europe are convinced that they must do all in their power to avoid such confrontation. Second, European integration is also an economic necessity. Europe is in ruin following two successive wars. It must rebuild and to do so faced with two new superpowers, the US and the USSR. It must unite. Thirdly, and immediately after the end of World War II, a new conflict emerged that I have mentioned before, the conflict between the US and the communist USSR, the so-called Cold War. European integration, European unity, is a response to the rise of communism and the construction of the communist bloc in Eastern Europe. As for the ideals and principles, they were largely laid out in the European Convention on Human Rights, adopted in Rome on the 4th of November 1950. Their human rights protection, democracy, accountability, coupled with some degree of respect for national sovereignty. Let's look at how this convention protects freedom of expression. The protection of freedom of expression is done through Article 10, which states in paragraph 1, everyone has the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to hold opinion and to receive and impart information and ideas without interference by public authority and regardless of frontiers. This article shall not prevent states from requiring the licensing of broadcasting television or cinema. If you recall Article 19 of the UDHR, the paragraph 1 of Article 10 of the European Convention is very similar to Article 19 of the UDHR. The last sentence, the uh, fact that states uh, can license broadcasting and cinema completely lost its significance fairly quickly. So much so that it is nowadays rarely, if ever, mentioned in the context of Article 10 of the European Convention. But Article 10 does not end here. It goes on to state under paragraph 2, the exercise of this freedom since it carries with it duties and responsibilities may be subject to such formalities, conditions, restrictions or penalties as are prescribed by law, necessary in a democratic society, 
in the interest of national security, territorial integrity or public safety, for the prevention of disorder or crime, for the protection of health or morals, for the protection of the reputation or rights of others, for preventing the disclosure of information received in confidence or for maintaining the authority and impartiality of the judiciary. This is here a marked difference between the UDHR, which had a very small uh, and visionary article about freedom of expression, and the European Convention, which includes quite a few restrictions. Indeed, longer list of restrictions than the one we have already seen in the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights. We will analyze Article 10 in comparison with Article 19 in a next lesson. In the meantime, though, let me highlight a few things. First, the notion of duties and responsibilities is unique to the Convention. It does not appear in any other article and it's most notably absent from the articles containing restriction clauses. So already in 1949, there was a notion that freedom of expression does require some form of duties and responsibilities on those expressing themselves. Second, Article 19 introduced the idea that freedom of expression may be restricted. The wording of paragraph 2 of Article 10 has very much become the global norm, more or less reflected as such in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as we have seen in the previous segment, but also in the Inter-American Convention and in the African Convention, as we shall see. The provision set out a test for assessing whether limitation to freedom of expression are legitimate. This is a legal standard that has very much become the norm right now. And as I had mentioned earlier, it has three components, the legality, the necessity, and a list of specific ground. The European Convention as an enforcement mechanism, the European Court of Human Rights, and I want to spend a bit more time on, on that body because it is probably the most uh, important element uh, of the European system and it is possibly its most effective. First, let me highlight the fact that this supranational body responsible for ruling over dispute between a state and its citizen did not exist until the European uh, Convention set it up. There had been various attempts at bringing nations together before, including through the League of Nations at the beginning of the 20th century. There had been a permanent court of international justice established, but it was responsible for ruling over dispute between states, not between an individual and a state. Immediately after the war, military tribunal, including the Nuremberg Tribunal, had been established, but with a very strict mandate the prosecution of war criminal. But there had never been an international court responsible for ruling over human rights violations and for ruling over the relationship between a state and its citizen in Europe or anywhere in the world. So this is a remarkable establishment. The European Court for Human Rights is established in 1959. Since then, it has delivered some 10,000 judgments a fair amount related to freedom of expression. It rules on individual or state applications alleging violation of the right set out in the European Convention. It is a key mechanism through which the European Convention is enforced and its jurisprudence is one of the main sources of global norms on freedom of expression and information. First, the decisions are binding on the member state. That's a fundamentally important uh, aspect of the effectiveness of the European Court. Its ruling are also quoted, referred to by European Court around the region and beyond that region. Indeed, as we will see throughout the remaining of the lessons, the uh, decisions of the European Court become jurisprudence and set precedent that are not only important in Europe, but are also important in Latin America, in Africa, 
and in other places around the world. The European Court is the first international human rights body that has elaborated upon the restriction to freedom of expression and information and developed a very extensive jurisprudence around how the three components of the test, legality, necessity, and specific ground, how those must be interpreted. So how is it that Europe opted for this fairly radical transnational judicial mechanism of accountability? the first of its kind historically. To answer this question, let's listen to Mr. Teitgen. He's a member of the French resistance during the war and after the war, one of the drafters of what became the European Convention. In September 1949, reporting to the Council of Europe on the progresses made towards developing the convention, he said something that I want to read. Democracies do not become Nazi in one day. Evil progresses cunningly with a minority operating as it were to remove the levels of control. One by one, freedom are suppressed in one sphere after another. Public opinion and the entire national conscience are asphyxiated. And then, when everything is in order, the four is installed and the evolution continues even to the oven of the crematorium. A conscience must exist somewhere, which will sound the alarm to the mind of a nation menaced by this progressive corruption. An international court and a system of supervision and guarantees could be the conscience of which we all have need. That is at the heart of the creation of the European Court for human rights, um, a body which is historically of primary importance for human rights protection in Europe, but beyond Europe. The thinkers for European unity and integration, though, were not only concerned with attributing power to a supranational body. They also were looking for a way of preserving the principle of national sovereignty, and this they did in two ways. First, they ruled out the option of one European-wide legal framework. They didn't want a legislation that will apply to all of European countries. Rather, they opted to establish the European Court, which will deal with cases and progressively establish a jurisprudence. And second, the European Court itself, through its jurisprudence, attributed a space of maneuver to national authorities in fulfilling their obligations under the European Convention. This space is a so-called margin of appreciation. The court first explained the concept of margin of appreciation in one of its first decisions, Andyside versus United Kingdom in 1976, the first decision related to freedom of expression. In that case, the court had to consider whether a conviction for possessing something that has been described as obscene could be justified under Article 10 as a limitation upon freedom of expression necessary for the protection of morals. Was that restriction necessary? And the court noted, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from, from it, by reason of their direct and continuous contact with the vital forces of their countries, state authorities are in principle in a better position than the international judge to give an opinion on the exact content of those requirements of morals, as well as on the necessity of a restriction or penalty imposed to meet them. Nevertheless, Article 10 does not give the contracting states an unlimited power of appreciation. The court, which is responsible for ensuring the observance of those states' engagement, is empowered to give the final ruling on whether a restriction or penalty is reconcilable with freedom of expression, as protected by Article 10. The domestic margin of appreciation thus goes hand in hand with European supervision. The doctrine allows member states a margin of appreciation in determining whether it is necessary to impose a restriction on the exercise of freedom of expression. 
in practice, states enjoy a wide margin of appreciation when they impose restrictions on sexually explicit content, on commercial speech, or on disclosure of official secrets. Many observers and experts, including myself, lament the use of the doctrine. We believe that it undermined the Convention for Human Rights and the principle of universality. Indeed, the European Convention is the only existing international court that refer to that principle, as we will see the inter-American system does not. However, overall, the uh, European Court have largely succeeded in avoiding a systematic recourse to the margin of appreciation, except in cases that are very much related to public morals, to obscenity, to, to this kind of, um, of restrictions. Over the 60 years of its existence, the European Court did play the role first envisaged in 1949. Its jurisprudence established some fundamental principles which laid the ground for codification by the European Union and the Council of Europe. I'm going to highlight here in conclusion three fundamental principles which the Court has systematically repeated over time, principles which are at the heart of freedom of expression, principles which have been cited, quoted, referred to around the world. The first concern the importance of freedom of expression to democracy. Freedom of expression constitutes one of the essential foundations of a democratic society, one of the basic conditions for its progress and for the development of every man. This is one of the most often repeated and quoted statements from the European Court, and you will find that cited in jurisprudence from around the world, and indeed in political discourse and in policy making. The second principle which has been laid out by the European Convention is that the guarantee of freedom of expression applies with particular force to the media. The court has consistently emphasized the preeminent role of the press in a state governed by the rule of law. It has stressed that freedom of the press affords the public one of the best means of discovering and forming an opinion. It gives politicians the opportunity to reflect and comment on the preoccupation of public opinion. It enables everyone to participate in the free political debate, which is at the very core of the concept of a democratic society. And thirdly, most importantly, and possibly most controversially, the European Court has established the principle that freedom of expression includes the right to shock and to offend. Let me quote from them here. The right to freedom of expression is applicable not only to information and ideas which are favorably received or regarded as inoffensive or as a matter of indifference, but also to those that offend, shock or disturb the state or any sector of the population. Such are the demands of pluralism, tolerance, and broad-mindedness, without which there is no democratic society. The right to offend or shock is protected under the European Convention. To wrap up, we have reviewed the emergence of the protection of freedom of expression in Europe, the principles guiding this protection, and one of the key bodies responsible for ensuring its implementation that is, the European Court. To find out more about the European Convention and the ruling of the European Court, please listen to our expert, Professor Dirk Wuhoff from Ghent University. He has fascinating insight based on some 30 years of work and observation of the European system. Next segment, we're going to look at how the regional protection of freedom of expression is enshrined within the Americas. <laughs>